and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. My name's Phil. Joining me as usual, I've got Rohan. Hey, Rohan, how are you doing? Hey, good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. And today we're joined by Tim. Hey, Tim, how are you? Hey, I'm good. As usual, this episode of the Home Assistant Podcast is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nabucasa. Easily access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that supports the Home Assistant, ESP Home, and ZWaveJS projects. Configuration is done via the user interface, so no fiddling with router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. Tim, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and, and how you got here today. So uh, I'm just up the road from you, Phil. I'm in Canberra. Nice. Yeah, just in, a little bit up the road. Here yeah. in Australia. <laughs> so <laughs> I've sort of just starting in home assistant and a bit of home automation. Um, I started out actually with some some of the, not professional gear, but like the more commercial home autom- home automation kind of bits of kit. We had some renovations on a house I was living in and our electrician recommended some products that were dimmers that you could link together across the wiring. So they're really good to install. They had a, gr- and they just had a great interface to them that, and just solved a few of the issues around the house, like having two, two dimmers either end of a hallway and things like that. They were great. And they were great for bedrooms as well. You could start, you know, set a default dimming level and all those kind of little settings. And they were, they were a good product on their own. Their smart home add-on though was a three hundred dollar box that goes in the ceiling, and you needed one of them per circuit, plus Ooh. their hub. Yeah. What? So they acted the the box you'd put in the roof would act as a third or second or third dimmer. Yeah. On the circuit, and just in, and then interface to a hub that you'd also have to buy. So I don't know if I've ever heard of that. Yeah, it was it was quite, and they they did a range of different switches as well. So you could have, have not a non dimming switch and mm. just a few front ends. Um, they the company who makes them used to own Clipsal, which is a big brand here in Australia for electrical products. Yep, which are okay. Schneider Electric, I think. Schneider is now is has got yeah. the brand. Okay. Gerard Industries is the company who used to have it, and they're the ones who made make the products now. They're really good, but yeah, they're, they're at the time that we looked at it, the smart home add-ons were were very expensive for what they were. Particularly when we're just talking about lighting here, right? Like you've got to have a three hundred dollar box just to do lights, and that doesn't include you know, anything else: presence, motion sensors, or audio. Just to just to add the functions that were already on the wall. That seems really hard to justify. Yeah, I, I don't know what the status of it is now and whether they, what their pricing is now for that add-on. Sure. I've seen the dimmers themselves used. Funnily enough, I've seen them used in Ikea. Oh, really? <laughs> if you go to the lighting section and when you uh, get to try out some of the lights, on some of the boxes at the Ikea here in Canberra, the dimmers are actually the Gerard Industry dimmers. Nice. Interesting. So, so they are—they are properly commercial. They are properly like for years. They're the—they're the ones who make the light switches. So for the North American markets, you think the companies like Square D and all those kind of companies that that make the products that go in the walls. So that—that's their history. And it was the dimmers are really good. You know, you can program them just by holding the button down and all those kind of simple things. Yeah, but they were—they were a good introduction so- to having an interface. Not just a switch and a control right. and a dimmer, but they had options like default light setting, how how low you want it. So it could work with LED lights. You could go, you could set your minimum brightness and your maximum brightness and things like that. And through you installing those, I started asking questions that I wanted to send back to the manufacturers to say, can we do certain? Can you program them in certain ways, like? for the hallway have dimmer at one end start them at full brightness because you're walking in from the front door 
right. the dimmer at the bedroom end start at minimum brightness because you're probably going to turn it on at night and walk down the hallway and those kind of little interface options. But I never sort of took it any further than putting those ideas together in my mind. And then I'd heard about home assistant and home automation in general, you know, and been around mm-hmm. tech long enough to remember even X10 stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that kind of on off functionality and that's it. So that's sort of the seed of moving on to home automation and actually having a go at this stuff. And, and now I'm now in a new home, it's a rental. So I don't have many options for changing things. I looked at Shelley's for in wall and things like that for other options, but then decided on the Ikea stuff. I'd seen friends who just used it and they'd asked me about it from a, a security, an IT security point of view. And of course it's all offline. So I thought I'll give it a try as well. And it's easy to pick up and quite. So I will get, give some background because I think I came from the exact same position you were, Tim, like when I started with Home Assistant. So um, I was also renting when I got into home automation, you know, when I first moved out of home, that was it. I want to get into home automation, but, you know, renting, right? So in Australia, we have some pretty strict uh, rental laws, which makes it very hard to do some fun stuff in home automation. For example, um, most leases are generally up for 12 or 24 months. Um, so you're only guaranteed to be living in that house for 12 months, which doesn't incentivize you to do any long-term changes to the house. Not that you could do much anyway, because in the lease agreements, you're not allowed to change light bulbs sorry not allowed to change light switches you can change light bulbs you're expected to change light bulbs but light switches or any permanent fixtures so blinds um, basically anything that could be screwed into the wall you're not allowed to touch without the landlord's position uh, permission so and not to mention that we're on 240 volt electricity anyway so any changes behind the wall need to be done by sparky slash electrician um, so totally feel you where it comes to where your your current position, right? Um, So I guess with that, like what have you sort of started looking at for your home automation at the moment? Um, Well, the the first thing I've set up is the living room. Mm -hmm. So I, I, this rental's a bit, bit fun. It's a bit of an older place with high ceilings. So yeah, I, I like how you mentioned expected to change a light bulb. I had to break out a, what five foot ladder <laughs> yeah. to change these light yeah, bulbs? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, the the irony there of having to change the light bulbs, but needing a ladder <laughs> in a rental. So I've set up the living room with some lights up on the ceiling. Uh, just the other day, I got hold of a light for the reading lamp as yeah. well because yeah. I just wanted an ability to control the lighting better. Mm. This rental has been built where the living space is all um, track spotlights. So the wow. living room has six GU10 yep. lamps in it, and yep. it's not a huge space. It's the yep. kitchen has nine, and it's even smaller. Wow. Wow. So it's quite bright. <laughs> and so it's either a choice of one lamp beside you, which just doesn't quite cut it all the time. Or being out, I just wanted to dim the lights and that was it. And right. like you said, Phil, you can't do anything here. You can't touch it. So I couldn't put it, couldn't put a dimmer in. I wasn't going to try and talk to a rental agency to convince them. And then I'd have to find a, a electrician who would do such a simple job anyway and things like that. So it just made sense to get some smart light bulbs and just set them up to do the dimming and from there i've already bought a whole bunch of the ikea switches and they come in packs anyway so the you know that's a good thing about the gu10 is they come in a pack of three with one of these already set to go and then it's always handy walking around ikea you get to the cheap section at the end and there's always something useful in there. The old, the little um, sound controls. These are now the old model. 
Right. So right. I have a few of the brand new in the box in a, in my random uh, stash somewhere that I, yeah. I linked one up. And I think I, I yeah. had probably similar intentions to you. I was like, oh, I can dim lights on and off or control well, lights with these. This is the but, exact same interface as the dimmers on the wall that I started mm-hmm. with, a button click and left and right. And yep. there's enough yep. functionality in that already. So I've had a go doing some automation with it. I kept with Zigbee because I also wanted to do things like binding groups, mm. grouping and binding. I've got lights in the bedroom for bedside lamps, which were a pre right. pre done kit. So I can change the color temperature. I can dim them and it's instantaneous. Beautiful. So yeah. that, but that's not, that's just off the switch. I'm not, until I get my Zigbee network happy and healthy, I'm not going to mess with those lights. To, you know, they're, yeah. they're working on their own. But yeah, there's a lot of intricacies to the IKEA stuff and Zigbee at the moment, and it's been a bit of a exercise to not only get it work, get, get these switches in particular working, but getting the information has been a bit of a challenge as well. So these steer bar switches at the moment, um, well, ZHA in general doesn't have over-the-air updates running for IKEA stuff. There's the information I've been getting from my interaction on GitHub with the ZHA team is that there's instability in the way they do their updates. And through a bit more Google searching and Reddit searching and things, I ended up on the ZigPy GitHub. And ZigPy is the back end of ZHA, where the detail is that IKEA have changed the date code on their software updates. So the newest version of of the firmware for these in particular, when you write out the version number in hex, becomes a number that's less than the old version's number in hex. Oh, of course it is. So it is the most bizarre roundabout quirk. So you couldn't do a proper update. There's also issues with the updates with binding and things like that. The one feature I really want to get working with them, I've not been able to bind any of the lights I've got set up to one of these switches yet. So that's why I'm sort of holding off on some of those parts. But I haven't even advanced much of beyond setting those lights up because I've got yeah. enough for what I already want. I can, I've already set up two, I've got two scenes with not only just different dimming levels, but turning off individual lamps. And that was a, that was an amazing just little insight. I didn't even think to do it right at the start. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to use a group, dim everything, yep. and then just playing around, I realized I can turn off individual lights. So I've got a scene with everything, and then one scene where half the lights turn off, some of them dim because they're pointing at the TV, and then there's one yeah. left on right behind you. So you get a wash of light, but it's not in your face. It's not uncomfortably dark, like having just one reading lamp in the room would be. Right. And it was a bit of, so a, a bit of my really part, distant past history is I worked in television before switching over to working in IT long, long ago. And I did things like lighting design. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. So this stuff must frustrate you then when you can't get it exactly yeah. the way you want it. That's why I've sort of stalled with Home Assistant is I have, uh, I've got two buttons on that I can call up on my phone that do pretty much everything I want for now, which is not great. Like I've, I've not, yeah, I'm using the, the just, I'm just using the default Lovelace desktop Mm -hmm. uh, dashboard. So, and I'm just using it like that. I'll, I'll leave a page open on my phone go find Lovelace and then find the scene button. I, I, I could be doing so much more than that. I just haven't got there yet. I've just not had time right, 
lately. And with the issues like this, like this would be perfect for switching through scenes and having layers of control. But with those issues that um, I've not even been able to pair them at times. I was going to say Ikea's um, pairing methodology sometimes is frustrating. So I've got some of those GU10 bulbs. Um, and I, I use them in one very specific place, which is my um, range hood lights, right? Like, so right above my the exhaust in the kitchen. And and that's the only place I have smart bulbs in the house. I have two of them and I've gone through a bunch of those, probably some lying around in my office somewhere, like the dead ones. But it's I've actually seen people make like little kits to turn it off and on and off and on. Because you got to you gotta uh, flip the power, depending on the model you have. Some of them are six times, some of them are seven times, uh, where you have to turn it on and off, on and off, on and off. But there's also a thing where, depending on what you get, when you're resetting the pairing, so if it's already paired and you're resetting it, there's a thing where sometimes you may have to take the bulb right next to your zigbee radio like literally like a foot away from it usually when you read the instructions and they're like keep it right next to it you can be a few feet 10 20 feet whatever apparently not with the ikea ones there's something in there that makes it super low range once it gets paired right so right brand new it's great second time around you have it's like you know you're kind of banging your head on the table a little bit there right so um that's something i've learned with the ikea the G10 bulbs specifically. Um, I don't know if that applies to all of their bulbs and stuff like that, but yeah, there there is such a huge. It's great for the price, but it's also like the other side of it is you also get what you pay for, right? So it, it's yeah. a little bit of the of both of those. I haven't had that yet. I I paired them once. I actually bought they here in Australia. IKEA have a little G10 desk lamp for for absolutely nothing so i it, then i had a test bed where i could i had to do each bulb and of course because it's on a what, eight foot ceiling i don't want to be i didn't want to be up a ladder trying to twist a bulb in and out of a socket so um yeah that i i i saw a, a few of those issues mentioned and was a bit concerned about using them but yeah i i paired them all with the coordinator in the same room and then move them to the room next door. The reception's yeah. fine. And they, they've worked really well. It's the, the switches have been the thing that's been the most annoying for me. And I actually got one very good tip from one of the developers for the ZHA is I've been pairing them directly to the coordinator. And I, I the, sometimes they just won't even work. They'll... They will show up. There were a few times, one update ago, where they wouldn't yeah. even show up until you restarted the whole stack. Amazing. And then they were still dead on arrival and wouldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. They're a bit better now, but the the tip they gave me was actually try pairing them through something like one of their smart plugs. Yeah. Which you're acting as a router, but they, they, do, they pair a lot quicker to IKEA's own devices, which makes sense. I think it's also that they that device is closer, right? So again, like I, I had a couple of their repeaters where same thing I'd pair through there. Right? I've been doing it all just sitting in my desk in my room. So the, the coordinator is actually the closer thing at the time, but it it's just, I've, I've gone with a, a land based coordinator for, which is um, one of the yeah. Texas instruments chipsets. And then yeah. ESP32, the the UZG1, which is yep. it's a nice device, but it just yeah. seems to not like pairing to these switches. But these switches also don't seem to like pairing with much sometimes. <laughs> so yeah. that's been the real big frustration that I've had is trying to get that second, the, the interface working. And then I'll move on to how I want to actually program these interfaces and doing things like automation so for now it's just been simple direct control i will say that the zigbee pairing like the zigbee binding the only time i've ever had it work was with and i actually have it on my desk here 
one of these standard Philips Hue uh, little remotes, right? Connected to a Philips Hue remote via the Philips Hue hub. As soon as I've tried to use this outside of the Philips Hue hub with like, doesn't matter if it's Zigbee to MVTT, ZHA, um, it, the binding, whatever I'm trying to bind it to just does not work. It could be a Philips Hue bulb or another branded bulb. Just the binding in Zigbee I find can be really, really like, temperamental um and and same thing with you like i've got um ikea sell um some open and close buttons for their smart blinds you just get independently yeah. um there's zigbee base so i've paired them up with my um zigbee coordinator uh and once again it just randomly has disappeared off the network right i had automation set up you know um to open and close blinds that aren't ikea blinds but they're zigbee blinds i didn't bind them it was just simple you know fire an event when the button is clicked and it worked for a few days and now they're gone and i just haven't been bothered to try and pair them up again um and you know though you mentioned you had the um the, the sonos sonos uh controller the yeah. little circle one i had grand plans for that i was like oh it's just a zigbee device right i'll just pair it uh i'll just bind it to a, a bulb and use it to dim you know no it doesn't work that way um even to the point where it's like all right i'll just go through home assistant and when I, I dim it down a level, Home Assistant will then go and dim the lights. But it'll tell you how much it's moved, but it won't do it, you know, nicely like a dimmer. It's a yeah. 50% well, to a 10% sort of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. yeah, it's funny. You watch the messages come through off these things and they're, they're, quite, they're quite strange messaging that they yeah. give off, when, especially when they're turning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's just, well, it, it's a volume control, not a dimmer. And yeah, that kind of exactly. that makes perfect sense, but yeah, they should yeah. translate a bit easier. They look great. They've worked pretty well, and doing this stuff directly, so using it with the light bulbs directly, where I want that instant reaction for now, they've been pretty rock solid. Um, I'm really disappointed. These are the little switches that come with the older smart plugs, and I'm really disappointed these aren't for sale individually because they're just they're a really good design and even though smart plugs are going out for the new smaller model but these ones were in a pack with the long larger ones right um i know there's already a bit of a a black market for these so people are really wanting the little volume controls around the world because the new one doesn't look anywhere as good oh really well i might I've got a couple, so yeah. If and Australian IKEA seem to be the ones with the most. So th there's been a bit of a side hustle of buying them up and exporting them. So that was something I found out as well. That was quite funny to find and and see the just if yeah people really interested in using them to the point of having to try and find them again. But yeah, that's that's been interesting to and and just all the fault finding like it, it's. It's been frustrating for slowing down what I want to do. But at the same time, there's been some really, like finding a wrong hex value was just brilliant. <laughs> yeah, Hopefully I can get started with a bit more now. Um, I picked up some really good things off AliExpress as well. Uh, mm -hmm. They actually have, I normally see like the WLED controllers mm -hmm. and that's right. about it. Yeah, everyone just doing their own version of these. These ones are actually a Zig, Zigbee Direct one. And uh, this uh, one, uh, yeah, yeah, they're uh, just, they're uh, Zigbee, yeah. straight Zigbee yeah. for light strips. Um, this one's actually dual channel pre-programmed to be color temperature. I've got one for now, which is for adding to the bedroom with the bedside lamps to do circadian lights and do, and do a sunrise light. Um, I, that was my first sort of, idea for home automation it's timed lights with you know, a simulated sunrise because here in canberra in the middle of winter the sun does not come up until after <laughs> half past seven it's it, yeah and it if it affects the whole city everyone everyone has that seasonal <laughs> effect yeah. and just the place gets miserable sometimes yeah yeah, yeah. but now the light's back i'm I've sort of not haven't 
finished the build yet on that. I don't need it anymore. The lights, you know, I'm, I'm waking up at 5.30 again already because the light's coming through the windows. That was the first inspired idea. And then that was a really good find. So there's there's a range. They do a single channel all the way through to RGB in color temperature. Yeah. I remember when I was looking at those, um, yeah, for like the 50-50 LED lights, I think there were. There's a few options. Um uh, but yeah, they were very early days. So I think the Zigbee was very expensive. You could get them maybe off Amazon or something. Um, I just didn't trust it that it was going to work for what I needed. Um, and I think Ikea also now have a part of their like down strips, uh, down lights, not down lights, but the LED strips that you can get from Ikea. They have a Zigbee um, trad free LED controller now. Um, yes. I, I saw get, that in the yeah. shop the other day, actually. Yeah. Um, the LED strip. I, I thought wasn't that good. They the LEDs weren't that close together in the strip. Mm. Mm-hmm. But it it did have a white in there with it and it came with one of the steer bar remotes to do you know, that's the one they do for color temperature changing right. lamps. The, their range is increasing and it's and it's a good range. For its price, it's really good. Yeah, it's just been a bit difficult. And even IKEA no, I've seen through all that fault finding that people with just an Ikea ecosystem have had issues with these and that whatever's going wrong with them and obviously they're not updating. The the date code thing even hit Ikea's own ecosystem. So that's how funny that part was. Um, the new firmware also doesn't do, it doesn't do group binding anymore. You can only bind devices to the switch. Oh, interesting. Which I think is a bit strange. I think from what I've sort of been able to cobble together, I mean, when they come in the box, they're bound by group. Right. Which makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That That's that's an interesting fault in the new firmware. So I think you can sort of downgrade them. I haven't tried it yet. The only way I found to actually upgrade even was I started up a Zigbee to MQTT stack just mm. for updating them and then tear the stack down. And that was actually really good to see in Home Assistant and and next door to it. So I just had Zigbee to MQTT as its own little container, started that up, pointed it at the at the UZG1, which is really handy because that's land-based. It was a lot easier to start that up than trying to get a USB device into a container. Yeah, I bet. And do all that. I just pointed at an IP address and did an update, closed that all down and then started ZHA back up. And it was really good. ZHA noticed that the Zigbee radio had been changed and just all it popped up was a question, do you want to restore from a backup? Yes. And my whole Zigbee network was stood back up without a problem. It was really good. That's awesome. And it's, yeah, and I, I'm wanting to see now if I if I set both Zigbee to MQTT and ZHA to the same radio settings, I've got a suspicion I should be able to run them at the same time. Same radio settings? How? Like, do you mean like channel and like Z, Zigbee to MQTT was set to channel eleven? ZHA is set to channel twenty. So ZHA just noticed that the channel had changed. And a few, I think a few other settings for like communication speed. But I know this, the user G1 can have more than one connection. It actually tells you how many connections to the, Zig, mm. to the Zigbee port are open mm. at any one time. I've got no reason to try it. Like there's no, I don't see any reason to run both apart from just the, just giving it a go. Just as a weird little challenge, but it was a good little find. I wonder what the implications of that are just again, just trying to think that if it's got to coordinate multiple things at once, how does that work? Right. Like in the sense that I don't think it can be on two channels at once. It, I no, no, the, that's the, not the case. And that, that's what, yeah. So it, yeah, that's what it disliked. But if I, I, I think if I set both, it, both software to the same settings, yeah. Then there's because, no conflict that's going to flag, oh, you need to restore from a backup. I'm pretty sure you can have multiple coordinators in Zigbee. 
um, from that's I mean I haven't dabbled with Zigbee to MQT for quite some time, but I was pretty sure there was an ability to pair multiple um, coordinators at some point um, as a backup or, or something. Maybe it's going down that sort of path a little bit. It's all not really useful for anything, but just no, no, seemed like a fun experiment. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's what would be cool is actually just like kind of how we have uh, Bluetooth proxy with ESP32s and stuff, right? Where you can just take these ESP32s, stick them around the house, whatever, or or maybe they're already embedded in whatever device, your motion sensor or whatever, and it acts as a Bluetooth proxy, right? You can do the same kind of thing where whether it's Zigbee or ZHA or whatever, that's kind of, I guess that's kind of the other way though, because now you're saying, you have multiple radios going back to one, uh, one, one Zigbee technically well, you, coordinator. You actually have one, but, you yeah. have multiple controllers running one radio. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm talking the other way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And if they're just, if yeah. they're just using it as a, as a broadcast radio, like a, I, I don't see there any point trying to pair one device to two coordinating software, but there's no reason two different softwares doing their own thing couldn't share a radio. Yeah. But it was good to see that the network stood up to messing around with the coordinator and it came back up. The, the UZG1 itself can actually, you can reflash it to have a Bluetooth proxy on the side as well because it's its controller is an ESP32. So there's a bit of scope within the hardware to do some interesting things with it. That's still in beta. People have said the two ra- the two radio types interfere. But I think that's also they're using the radio on the ESP32 then at the same time as they're using the Zigbee radio. So that's that's not ideal so i'm i don't and i don't need any of that i've i've not thought about doing presence detection just yet it's just me and two kids in the house so and they're under five so i know where they are they're mostly (laughs) under four so i guess that that sort of leads into my next one so now you've got we you know you've got lighting sort of a plan for that where are you going to head to next in terms of your your home automation where where else you want to be able to get home system controlling? I, th- I think the first thing before I even sort of continue with the lighting for now is I, I'm neurodivergent, sometimes painfully obvious. And th- things like to-do lists and organisation and things like that are always a bit of a challenge. And with two young kids who are now sort of getting to the age that you want to give them their own responsibility has been quite useful. There are two things that sort of merge together that I've been looking at things like chores charts for kids. Right. And ones with check marks and things on them just, and then it occurred to me that's pretty much the best thing for me as well is a giant list of tasks and being able yeah. to check them off. So doing, getting into dashboards and, interfaces that are front and center around the house to just keep track of all those kind of things. And even to the point even of um, in the neurodivergence stuff, the AI has been an absolute okay. boon. Mm. Um, there's some and tools that you give it a broad task and the tool will break down that task into individual items, individual steps of a task and yep. generate a, check, a checklist from that, those kind of tools as well. So merging all of those worlds and back to interface and and being able to interact with it in a helpful way is sort of, I think, the next part I want to have a look at. Yeah, well, we just had um, Benjamin on as uh, a guest uh, to the previous episode, to the previous guest episode, um, and he's done some great stuff with AI. I was very like blown away by like, oh, that's fantastic, right? To the point of, hey, let's get uh, my uh, maintenance list on the house, right? Like, and get throw that into AI and give it that 
let that prioritize or let, you know, uh, cadence of going to the grocery store and get AI to say, yep, should probably buy this today while you're at the grocery store. Yeah, they, they, I listened in on that one and, and they were great ideas. Yeah, just yeah, in great ways to get started. Um, a few other things I re- I'd really like to try is Amazon came out with a feature for Alexa a little while ago to allow you to read along to a storybook and it would control hue lights in the room and oh yes that's right what i've never heard of this yeah it was i i saw i saw one promo for it once so you you there's particular storybooks that they've got okay pre-recorded scenes for them so you yeah the the downside is you need the device in the room with you yeah (laughs) and i and i'm not one who's going to like I don't, I don't like those devices in general. Um, I'm a bit IT security conscious about those kind of things in general. Yeah. But also, I'm, uh, I, you know, we've all seen those, especially about the Amazon devices, how they've been accessed in reverse. So having one of those in the bedroom was a terrifying idea. But yeah, watching them, watching the demonstration. There's the dad reading the story and then the lights change on mm. cue with what he's reading. And they even have little sound clips that play off the speaker. Interesting. So so it's listening to your voice. So because like you would read something differently than I would read or Phil would read or Yeah, and it, it paces to your voice. I've seen I, I've been to events with the kids where they'll have a storybook on a PowerPoint and they'll flip a page and there'll be a sound effect. Or something happen, but it's not quite on cue with what you know. If they don't, if they read at the wrong pace, Mm. it it goes out the window. This keeps pace with you and listens for the cues and things. And I really, I I found that was a really cool idea. And if I can do something locally to that extent, that'd be great. The minimum is just doing a scripted what you would really call an automation a, a set of automations like and yeah. and having some some kind of little interface where i could click through the automation along with my pace and or not even need a device to click through like if if i'm the only one reading stories i can time everything to my pace like it was it was such a sellable feature yeah. and it's it's strange that it hasn't gone much further i i have seen it for when when phillips dropped proper ambi light from their tvs and went to what we have now you know cameras staring at screens Mm. i think hugh do the same thing they actually have an option where you put your phone near the speaker of a tv and it will then picks up and it oh, also, there is it, like a music mode, yeah, like where you put yeah. your phone against the speaker and it will like, yeah, just listen to the music and dart around the... For a little while, I think I tried extending that to movies as well. So as long as... And same thing, it's listening to keep pace with the movie, but it has a script in the back end for when to run the lights to go with the movie. I saw that a long time ago. I haven't seen it again since. And, yeah. I mean, and you know, the ambulight ideas are getting better and better again now, but they still... Yeah. You know, they rely on you having a media PC and things like that. We've got smart TVs. We all got rid of our media PCs, and yeah, because we all got a smart TV, and now we. That's you know, it. Why? Why don't they have something like Ambilight back? That would be a great little addition. But Ambilight for the kids' bedroom was just is something on the list as well. Oh, well, at that point, maybe it's a one-off kind of thing where you do have a media box, right? Like a media PC connected to whatever. That that can go on the yeah. far end of the list of projects to do um yeah yeah other things i think some some things out in the garden i started looking at irrigation systems and things and 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 te- again temporary because it is a rental i had to go trying out open sprinkler and really liked that and but i've seen now that even i think recently esp 32s now have an option for flashing them as a sprinkler controller in esp home so that should integrate straight away with Home Assistant. You don't even have to go to that level. There's, um, I think there's Zigbee 
um, timers. You can get like little timers, but smart taps or smart valves. You can get off um, even at Bunnings, like which is our local Home Depot hardware store. There is um, Bluetooth enabled, you know, smart taps, right? You can just put them outside in the garden, interface them with Home Assistant, and you've got an automated sprinkler, right? Well, and depending on what you want, if you want, again, like an actual like sprinkler system, right? You can always have the above ground ones. You don't, you don't have to necessarily dig in. I don't know what the rules are around that because if you ever move out, that's going to be kind of annoying to dig up the sprinkler. I think from it's, someone has had a go. They, there's bit, I keep digging up bits of black pipe. <laughs> Yeah, every so often there'll be another bit of black pipe that I find in in the backyard and half a sprinkler in one corner. So someone had it had a turn with it, and it's just all rotted away since. So I just I don't want anything too complex. Most more the gardens than the lawn and things like that. But I yeah, I've seen some some of the Zigbee valves. I really liked open sprinkler because it would it it was just that little bit more. You know, it, it is one thing for one purpose. Yeah. It did a timer, but you could also set set watering by volume. It took in yep. the weather. Um, it also integrated with, you could get um, a RF-433 module and add mm, it to it. Nice. Yep. You could use that to control old school RF-433 smart, well, not smart plugs, but remote plugs mm-hmm. and yeah. use them as stations. And the other feature it did was it would receive everyone's weather stations from around you, so you wouldn't have to buy a local weather station. You you just pick up on everyone else's weather station who has one in the in the area. So I thought that was a really good feature as well. So the rain, you didn't need to buy a rain sensor. You just stole mm. your neighbours. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> borrow, borrow. So you yeah, borrow it. Yeah. Well, listen, listen into it because it's broadcast. <laughs> So that was um, that was something I was looking at a while ago, and now I've moved to a rental here. Something I might look at again soon, and that integrates with Home Assistant from memory as well. So you can have that bit of low end control that you do need from something from like Open Sprinkler, but doing the timings yeah. and all that was something I was really interested in. I was going to the idea with using RF switches was to add the garden lights in on a timer Mm -hmm. you know they could just be their own little you know they look like a sprinkler channel but yeah there's one station that waters the lawn for 12 hours a night you know it didn't really matter and i think that's what some people do for things like you know ponds and or water features right where they might have you know like we need this pump running you know during the day for 12 hours to get the you know fountain running uh they can do it that way yeah, the ideas for projects, it's just finding the time and, and the bits and pieces. I've, I've got, I've been lucky with getting bits and pieces from friends like old Raspberry Pis. I've, I've got a stack of old Raspberry Pi 1s, which are just absolutely perfect for these kind of things. Um, I'd like my Pi hole is running on a Raspberry Pi 1B. It's absolutely perfect for it. I like the idea of separate hardware as well. So, one thing dies, the other one still running. Yeah, yeah. yes, everything's a separate device. I tried. I, yeah, yeah, I didn't have much luck getting ZHA, uh, not ZHA, Home Assistant itself running in a virtual machine with HAOS. Or I work IT all day, and no, it's not even that. No, the networking and things. So I was, I'm running Fedora Server, and I think I, my suspicion is Fedora Server. I think changes the names of the networks in the firewall so you follow anyone's guide online with a cut and paste for setting up something like a vm and it's trying to open ports on a firewall that's not being used like a zone a zone that's not being used in the firewall so there's a lot of messing around to do there i just grabbed another raspberry pi and put haos on it and i'm up and running so normally what I run is like for all of my Linux stuff, I usually run CentOS. I'm slowly switching, switching to Rocky Linux because CentOS, that's a political. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, like, but 
same thing but are you running stuff in uh like do you have a bare metal fedora server and then you're running it in like kvm is that what you're trying to do that's what I, yeah that's that's how i was trying to do i was trying to do hios in kvm and just was something about the fedora server and trying to use the guides online i was just trying to cut and paste things i it, i gave up and got a raspberry pi it was yeah yeah this is my day job i'm not going to sit here and do it for yeah. another six hours at night kind of thing um i use rel at work all the time so yep. it should work that, that was the most infuriating part was it's, <laughs> um it's... I, I did also want to try the immutable os's they they look really interesting for this kind of thing do, do you think that having more hardware though just leads to potential more breakpoints in your system like i've always found that like so for example i have uh, z-wave and zigbee running on two different machines right um if zigbee goes down my lights don't turn on because my sensors are zigbee right but if my z-wave network goes down the lights don't turn on because the dim is a z-wave right so now i've it doesn't matter which system breaks right i've just duplicated my my problems if you've got all these different Raspberry Pis around the house, do you think that that's just potentially, okay, my pie hole's gone down, and now I need to go and replace, and that's therefore causing all these other Raspberry Pis not to have their connection? Are you just potentially creating more breakpoints in your home? I would agree. So I've I've been very strict on what things I will use. So I'm I'm holding on to using Zigbee. That's why I was really happy to find a Zigbee. LED yeah. strip controller than buying a WLED one. So, and that's, I chose Zigbee because I could do binding. Well, at least I thought I could. You thought you could. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, and, and have that local control beside the, the more, the more fragile network. So, yeah, I sort of went into this with, with plans of, and, and also the latency, that was a big thing for me as well. You know, seeing these things work when when bound correctly and there being absolutely no latency, that was that was the 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 biggest thing for me. And the cha- the challenge now of trying to get them to work next is it is a continuing effort. Um I, I don't know about it being a big problem in general like my home production server i've now i've officially named it home production like i'm the idea You're of committed <laughs> oh yeah yeah in the idea Absolutely. of it being the home lab like it was that was okay. the first demarcation there's there's now a home production there's home prod and home yeah. lab that's funny it's like that's more of a an issue than any than having a lot of Raspberry Pis doing single tasks. I might yeah. lose one task if a Raspberry Pi goes down. And yeah, Pi Hole's a good example of that goes down, the network's in a pretty bad shape. Mm. Generally, if that's going to go down, it's while I'm not at home, so I don't really care. Yeah. And yeah. when I'm back, I, 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 I've I, bought things. AliExpress is great for all these kind of things. I've bought USB cables with power switches on them so i can just flick them off and on and reboot them i've that's a good idea actually that that's generally been the one fix i've had to do that raspberry pi for the pi hole uses the usb power from the router it's interesting yes are you so did you say you're running haos on a raspberry pi one or is it is it a new that's on a three i I had I, i also had a three yeah at the same time i'm i'm controlling a grand total of seven light bulbs at the moment and no switches. So I, I've yeah. installed hacks and the the rubbish bin calendar has has been the furthest <laughs> off off base I've gone with the home assistant. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I could probably run it on a yeah. Raspberry Pi one and and not apart from it being thirty yeah. two bit only, like that's the only problem is you can't actually get any OS for them now. Mm. Apart from the legacy stuff. So yeah, the next one I break out is just going to be a retro pie anyway. I think um, IKEA have just released, at least in the states. I'm hoping they're coming to Australia soon. The power monitoring smart plugs, 
So you can always get a few of those. Uh, chuck them on your dishwasher or washing machine. Get some automations happening around those. Know when they're done. Um, start monitoring your energy usage. Some fun things there too. Yeah, those are the things I, I'm about to disconnect my gas here in Australia. Like, Very nice. you got to love a rental. The only gas appliance is the cooktop. Of course it is. So I'm paying more for my gas connection a month than yep. yeah. the gas I used. And luckily the payment scheme for the the billing we have here in Canberra, they've got the the budgeted billing where you can be billed a certain amount each month. That total builds up and then they use that to pay off the bill. And luckily, because the accounts are joined with the electricity account, my extremely large winter electricity bill was paid off by my extremely large budget in the gas bill. Nice. Because the, the budgeting for the gas assumed I had more than a cooktop and the budgeting for the electricity was, wasn't was great. Um, they also have great fun with the rental, have a leaking hot water system. So all over winter... You're constantly paying for it, yeah. Const- you're filling you're it with const- crisp Canberra water at midnight, which is yeah. coming in at a nice cold temperature, so straight away it had to heat <laughs> itself. Oh. So... That was a fun discovery, even without power. Like that was without power monitoring. That would have mm. that would have been useful sure. over the winter to find that. Um, the power company actually were very helpful because they were able to look up the history of the building, not my account. Ah, oh, nice. And they were able to tell me that has happened. the The high winter bill has happened in this house for yep. a number of years, and it was wow. because the hot water system has been leaking. So that's been fixed, luckily. But that was. That was an interesting sort of eye opener, and yeah, confirmed an idea of like doing some power monitoring, being a bit more judicious about how to use power. Um, get rid of the gas, bought an induction cooktop, like and an air fryer, which seems to be yep. yeah. the standard two part kitchen these days. Did did you get have to get permission from the landlord to remove the gas cooktop, or you're I'm just not going to remove? Well, this and this is what people do. This is I've seen this on a few articles and things lately is people yep. just get a really big chopping board, a big thick wooden chopping board, put yep. it on top of the gas range and then put their portable inductions on top. Nice. So they don't so they don't start rattling the cooktop around with the induction yep. working underneath them. And then people just disconnect the gas and they'll come around um and in Canberra they're actually trying to they're actively removing gas from some suburbs already. They're trying not to connect new suburbs to to gas at all. There won't be reticulated gas in the suburbs. And there's lots of different programs for changing gas central heating to reverse cycle and things like that. They're really trying their best here to get rid of gas as a in in a homes yeah. You know, home yeah. distribution sense. Um I pretty you know, large scale it's not going away, but they're doing pretty well. I know they're also, um, Canberra is also, I think, 100% renewable now. Interesting. I know Adelaide was, sorry, South Australia was just there. I didn't realize Canberra's also. Canberra's been there for a bit. I mean, the yep. scale does help. Yeah, of course. ACT being, you know, the smallest physical sized territory and, you know, literally just Canberra, that's about it. That's, well, that um, is, yeah, that is all. <laughs> but, and and mo- most of that is actually outside of Canberra. They, mm. they own generation sites outside of Canberra and and they're part of the national the East Coast grid so they just bring it in so it's a big push here to be electric only and it's, so yeah that power monitoring and things like that will be something to look at I've, I've not been so inclined with that I like some of the features now coming out in home assistant with the even just I, I think even just sort of the mathematics, you know, have you've seen those features in the updates recently where they'll you can do the maths. Yeah, there's like yeah, it's like advanced sums and all that sort yeah, of Yeah, and and so just even having some kind of monitoring for things like the dishwasher and the washing machine, you know to an average how much it consumes in terms of power. So you could just do 
run it as mathematics in the background for something that's something's a large scale device. Same with the fridge. The, the refrigerator is always running. So yeah, just add that into the calculation as well. And things like exactly. that, I think, don't necessarily always have to have a device mm-hmm. plugged right in. And not even the right device, just something that monitors on off would be enough. And that could also go back into the checklists and the neurodivergent monitoring of me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you r- remind me to take that wet washing out of the washing machine three hours after it finished. I knew, I know I heard you the tune. Uh, LG devices are great. Like, you know, the microwave sings a tune, the washing machine yep. sings a tune, but it just, it does not click sometimes. You just, you just don't listen to it. It's funny. Like it's, we have, we have the same, right? The LG, whatever tune for the washing machine and stuff, but friends of ours, anytime we're there, I, I find that like, you know, if they're friends with kids and stuff, they're usually doing laundry like all the time. Right. And it's like, their washing machine will go off and I'm, I'm like, all of a sudden I'm like triggered. <laughs> <to> be, like... <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I, that's sort of as much as I've thought about using ha- home assistant. I don't really, I don't really want to go too far either. Well, what, what do you mean? If you don't want to go too far, then what, what are you talking to us for? <laughs> yeah. I, We're yeah, here to make yeah, you go yeah, too I'm far. Like... <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like, can't really anyway. Right, right? Um, I, I think I, I, I really like the idea of like, the devil being in the detail and, mm-hmm. and doing, I like the idea of making my own dashboard device that sits on a, the kitchen bench, not just yep. buying something off the shelf, but finishing it to the nth degree, like getting it looking like it could be a product off the shelf. Right. Do you mean physically wise or in the dashboard wise? Both really. Like I, yep. my history in, in TV production, I did a lot of the graphics on on screen and learned a lot about how to lay stuff out that it's easy to read, you know, mm-hmm. and and from a distance and and easy to collect that information. So that kind of user interface is, is something that a big reason why I haven't even started on dashboards yet is I know I'd just be stuck absolutely perfecting it and yeah. and not yeah. happy and then suddenly someone's released a new button you know the mm-hmm. i've been listening to the pot you know the podcast and your know, mushroom cards and bubble buttons and things that are coming out i just found Cluse has released a couple of videos explaining his new bubble buttons and things they yeah. only just came out this week so i was Started there's watching other those. ones as well that come out. Like I'll be on Reddit and one day, and then bam, there's a whole new uh, library that you can download. And it, yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah. I, I would stop looking at the devices and then just be on dashboards for the next. You know that that will be the next focus for yep. Lord knows how long. So I've held off on doing that. L- luckily, two scene buttons on the Lovelace dashboard have kept me quite happy and. I have been able to set up some groups and things, so that's been able to satisfy me. Like the the next few steps I've got is more GU ten light bulbs, but this time not from IKEA. I'm the next batch. I'm trying to get the cheapest price you can on AliExpress, which mm. can take a few days hunting down. Because dangerous, dangerous. So it, I, yeah, I get, are you going to go Zigbee as well? Like, yep. But they, yeah. they, they all coming from the same, like, I'm, I'm going to buy one and see what I get. But yeah, every shop has just got the same one. I was trying to hunt down the non-existent color temperature only dimmable. That's what I want. I, yeah. yeah, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the, the Ikea color temperature and dimming GU10 bulbs. No, I don't need color. I don't need RGB. But the color temperatures w- has been great. It's been like having it in bedside lamps, and and that idea of setting up circadian stuff. So I I would I'd really like to have color temperature and being able to match the color temperature in the whole house. Yes, would be yeah. great. So I was trying to find something like that, but of course I'm 
AliExpress. No chance. It's the one <laughs> RGB light bulb. Oh, well, it's Everywhere. RGB in color temperature at least. Yep. So it is there, but yep. but yeah, the the that's the next thing is to buy another. I think I need I need thirteen light bulbs. So I wasn't going to buy thirteen GU ten light bulbs from IKEA. Yeah, that, that just got expensive before I even left the house. All right. When I was renting, I had I think it was about twenty five. MR16 light bulbs that I needed to replace. Um, and MR16 didn't have, there was no smart MR16 light bulb at that stage when I was doing this. Um, so I ended up importing some random Zigbee ones from America um, that no, no, longer, uh, no longer being manufactured anymore. Now there's replacement ones, but yeah, it was just, yeah, you do one room at a time. Like, okay, I can justify doing the kitchen, which has six down lights. I'll buy six of them this time. You know, there's two hundred bucks spent, right? Um, and then that's the cost of renting, right? Because if you get an electrician out, it might cost you three hundred bucks for the electrician to just put one dimmer in, and he's done, right? For not your own house, right? Like, and that's it. And that's why, yeah, like the problem is then if you want to move you then have to get the electrician back out to pay that $300 again to undo whatever you've done. Um, that's assuming that every time the landlord comes in every six months to inspect your house, that so they don't say, hey, why have you touched this light switch? Put it back to the way it was sort of thing. Yeah, it's always a bit of a worry. But at least, yeah, light bulbs are easy. No one notices yeah. the light bulbs change. Oh, and um, I've like left rentals um, knowing that the next rental I'm going to doesn't have you know this um type of light bulb so i may as well just leave that light bulb plugged in because i'm not getting a ladder to take out the smart bulb right like it's oh i'll i'll get my ladder out for these ones i'll get, <laughs> um, get my ladder out um fingers i also had this place has g10 bulbs for yeah, you then. I've, I've been luckily um the ones i have replaced were three to a light a set of lights mm-hmm. and ikea sell the pack sell them in packs of three i haven't had the Clark Griswold esque fun yeah. of a set of four lights and buy having buying a you know the value packs a pack of three that yeah that will be the next one the the room I'm in now actually has a set of four so that's the other reason I was sort of not not liking the idea of going back to IKEA and having to buy odd numbers and things like that as well and also just the sheer cost of it yeah. I, I got lucky with the first sets of kits they had a sale at the mm. time they were clearing out sort of old runs of stock so i got the light sets for 45 dollars instead of the usual 70 so that was a good price jet for the so for three gu 10 bulbs and a, a steer bar remote so straight away i ended up with a spare steer bar remote because i was only going to need one for one room and then these i got for two dollars Two from bucks. the from the cheap section, you know, they've, they've got their seconds and run out section at the back of IKEA, and where you you people come to buy one cupboard front door that's broken and things like that, and that's always worth a hunt. Um, they've got at the moment the one near me, the IKEA near me has them for twenty five dollars in that section. So I just there was just two of these, didn't know exactly what they were I, I think i grabbed the qr code off the box and looked them up while i was standing there and then just went yep that's that's excellent i'll grab those play around with so i've, I've been lucky already and i keep watching ikea for the next time they're going to run a sale for that stuff that's the only mm-hmm. time it's worth getting it i was saying that's the best way to do it you got to just uh, stay on sales and you know if there's any local like facebook groups or whatever Right. Uh, a lot of times they'll be like, hey, you know, this per- this company's having a sale today or like, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Oh, the session at the moment is looking at AliExpress and trying to figure out the cheapest unit price because everyone sells differently, trying to find which is a real shop and which is not <laughs> looking at reviews as well and making, you know, because th- th- there's a bit of, there's some good intel in the reviews. There will be people who will get on there and complain when they've received a f- an actual fake a fake product. There seems to be a run on I on AliExpress 
now to have the unbranded product from a factory that's building it for a particular company, but then there'll be like a tertiary fake, like a fake of the fake that someone's copying the off brand version. And it's, so it can be a bit of a cesspool in there sometimes, but I've, yeah, I've, well, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised by the, this light controller. That was really good. I even, where I was working, were chucking out um, little DC packs for for like the the small scale desktop computers, and it's the perfect size, and they're twelve volt, three amp power supplies. So I was able to pick some of those up before they went in the bin and plugged straight into this, and I had this going in ten minutes. And and this is just some cheap you know, AliExpress brand. And the, this this has been the thing that syncs the fastest or pairs the fastest with Zigbee. Like this, this turned up ready to go. It's a two-channel controller ready for color temperature. As long as you stay with like international supported standards, like I remember I once bought, I think AliExpress had their like, um, was it the singles day I think they call it, which is in November 11-11. Um, um, and they had, um, I bought some Z-Wave stuff, right? Obviously Z-Wave having different frequencies, Australia having its own. So they sent me out, um, the switch I used to know specified I want the AU frequency and they sent me out, uh, the Australian plugs, but they were US frequency, um, Z-Wave modules. I'm like, nah, I need, uh, so I, then I had to pay return shipping to China, uh, then get them to send it back to me. Yeah. So as long as you stay like Zigbee, which is all the same around the world, then an RF, you know, the 433, I think it should, should be fine. And they're the two things I've been wanting to use anyway. So I've been, yeah. I should be okay there. Um, I'm pretty reluctant to buy anything that's mains voltage off there anyway. Um, the, the biggest thing for Australia mm-hmm. is China uses a plug that's very similar to Australia. It's just upside down. Yeah. No, it's actually, it's also a different size. It's very slightly a different size as well, apparently. Is that right? Oh. So, yeah, it's upside down. Which so all the plugs, all the, and and they yeah. they use an angled plug that's like a European one. So the the and or a UK one where the cord comes out the side. But yeah, you you take right. it to Australia and it comes out the top instead, which right. looks really great. But yeah, they're, apparently they're also in a slightly different size, which can cause issues and they'll just use thinner material in the plugs and things. So the, the pins themselves are a bit thinner, so they get a bit warmer. Right. You know, every time they say Australian plug and you see the cord, you know, straight away the cord's shooting out the top of it. Yeah, I'm... No. No. So, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, not going to get anything mains voltage. But, yeah, yeah anything low voltage. Um, I think I'll get some Zinkaby valves as well and things like that. I'm... Mm-hmm. Now I've got this module and it's working really well. I'm ready to. I'm going to go this weekend and order the light, you no, know, the dual white light strip to finish and the LED channel and all that, and finish off the circadian light, and then move on to doing automations and things like that with on that side. So that's yeah. There's a few yeah, and that's a good little yeah. You know, that's a night one night's projects hopefully yeah if i'm feeling focused enough or <laughs> don't get distracted by something else yeah and i like this like take a slow approach right like just get this perfect get this room nice all right now i can add it to home assistant and then i can automate it right and that's a really good way of putting it i think i think that's that's sort of what i've been doing like i got the gu10 lights right and then i realized mm. i've got a reading lamp in that room as well so on an impulse, went back out to Ikea to buy one extra light bulb. Yep. And it, it was actually a practicality thing. The One of the very handy things and what wants me, what I want to get the rest of the lights in the main rooms done is bedtime for the kids. As they're getting ready to get to bed and do all the all that routine things, I turn off all the lights in the main room of the house and I found myself reaching for my phone, turning off all the room lights in the living room 
from the other end of the house. It's it's quite elongated house. Yeah. But then if I've left the reading light on, I had to walk all the way back up the house to just stamp on the foot switch for this yeah. one reading lamp. <laughs> so I did that enough times to be annoyed by it that I've now yep. just bought that one extra light bulb and now that's done. It's dimmable, it's color temperature. Yeah. The room and the room will match. Like that that's mm. that's been the one and that was a really good sort of milestone. Being able to push a button on my phone and have everything in the room the same to match and the yeah. same consistent and then push another one and four of the lights turn off. There's just enough light for watching the TV. The TV's been the only thing that I can't properly automate. It's Android TV. It's fine. It's a mm. TCL TV, so it's not the best. You know, it, it's good for its price. Sure. But I can't leave. I can't leave the Android TV device on in Home Assistant. For some reason, when Home Assistant goes out and polls the network, the TCL TV just wakes up into completely. Oh, you're kidding! <laughs> so it's like, it away from the land signal, or sort of. It's it's doing something like that, or it's just. It's inside the TV. It gets mm. attention. So it just wakes the screen up. So I actually, I have to shut the TV down entirely. I do a full OS shut down and power down. Or the thing will, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up in the morning and the thing's doing the, the Android screensaver all night burning away. I, I've had a turn on straight after turning off which is great for the kids' routine as well. Like you're trying to get them to go get in the bath and you've stopped the TV. You want, And that was an automation I really wanted to try and work on was the lights in the room start dimming, the TV turns off, right, time for bath. Or even the text-to-speech is always good fun. They love hearing the TV tell them stuff. So yeah. I was going to try and get the, to get the TV to tell them when it's bath time, but... I can't trust that the TV won't turn itself on for the next 12 hours that night or after turning itself off, turn it back on. There is a uh, hacks component created by Frank. It's called Spook. Um, one of the great features that has is it has the ability to disable integrations um, by automations. So what you could do is you could do something like put a power monitor on the TV outlet when the power level drops to say that you've turned the TV off, put it into standby, get an automation to run to disable that Android TV integration in Home Assistant. And then because that integration is disabled, Home Assistant won't pull the TV to turn the TV back on. I'll look into that because it does, it, the TV, it, it, otherwise it works really well. It reports back when it's powered down. I, I've got full control of it because it is just Android TV. It works really well. Then you may not even need the power monitor. Like as soon as it's set yeah. power off, go in, just um, spook and disable the integration. Disable the integration. I think that's, yeah, you, that's a really great. You would just need a way to know when to turn it back on. Otherwise, you'll never know when you've turned the TV back on, but because um, the integration is disabled. But yeah, I'm sure you could find a way around that. I did think about this the other day. I did get one of the Mikey emotion sensors. So. Mm -hmm. As much as I don't really want to work on presence detection too much inside the house, I thought to try once. Yeah, I just wanted to see what they were like. They, they're good. They're a good motion detector. They're not a great. They're not a presence sensor. No, no. I need the MM wave. Yeah, stuff that. Mm. but yeah. It, it's going to. I think that's a good start for automation. Is the return home? I, I'll stick that in the garage. Yep. And when the car, when I back the car in. I can work off us getting home in the afternoon. Like, and, and a lot of that kind of really deep logic is something I would like to work on, I think. Like, wh why, why build another integration or tool when simple logic could... And I, I think I'll start working with Node-RED as well. I, I like that graphical interface. Mm. And yeah. start doing some logic stuff. If it's between you know, four thirty and six o'clock in the night, and I'm backing the car in on these days, then it's definitely time 
that I'm getting home with the kids. Yeah. Yeah, Start this routine up. Yeah. Then I've got calendars already for it's because I I co-parent the kids. So there's calendars already involved in that. There's an, they're easy to work with as well. So the information's all there. There doesn't need to be anything fancy about presence detection or even being on the way home. I've, I've not even installed the Home Assistant app on my phone. I just use the web app and just use the web pages. I've, I've got a wire guard tunnel running anyway. So Same that thing. was also right. fun that I only just thought about it the other night, just stopping my driveway and turn on the living room lights through the, and watch it from the outside. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just, you know, most childish thing, but it's, and did it with the remotes as well. When I first bought them and just standing the other end of the house and turning some light on and off was just hilarious to me for a night. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, it's, it's a good way of just opening up the, the, the scope of the ideas that that can flow from these kind of things. And That's it. Yeah. Well, I, you're going to go down a, a big rabbit hole and you're just starting. So great. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to the madness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I should have done this before it was winter. Like this, this was a perfect winter project in Canberra when there's no light and nothing else yeah. to do. But Tim, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you taking time to talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you.